author Steel Magnolias, and you're listening to Dave's Gone By on UNC Radio. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By. Very excited to talk to a playwright that we have on the show this Saturday morning. And, you know, there's people have written thousands of plays in just the last few years. But if you think back over maybe the past two and a half decades, the number of plays that have not just been successful, not just won Tony Awards or Drama Desk Awards or, or stuff like that, but if, if you think of plays that have crossed into the mainstream to the point that everybody knows them, whether they're theater goers or not, they're part of the, the lexicon of our culture. We don't have that many. We've got maybe Driving Miss Daisy is, is one of them. Crimes of the Heart, to some extent. Uh, Angels in America, but, you know, you ask anybody outside theater about Angels in America, and it really won't be too clear on what it is. But I'll bet you, you ask anybody about Steel Magnolias, and they will know, oh, yeah, there's, there's these women in the beauty shop, and they're all bonding together in a tragedy, and da-da-da, because that place, Steel Magnolias, has come into our whole cultural consciousness. It's now 25 years old. In the intervening times from when it was first produced off-Broadway, it's had a very, very successful film, and now, uh, most recently, a remake TV film. It's been revived on Broadway, and it has been done everywhere you can possibly think of. We did it at uh, the University of Northern Colorado, where this program is coming from just a, a year or so ago. But if you think Robert Harling, the author of Steel Magnolias, is a one-trick pony, oh, think again. Because Hollywood snapped him up, and he ended up writing screenplays for, for films like Soap Dish. And also, most recently, the television program GCB with Kristen Chenoweth was created by our guest, Robert Harling. And so, Mr. Harling, after that huge introduction, welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah, I do sometimes tend to run on in the intros, but I, I thought you deserved it. No, no, I'm just thinking, wow, I've been busy, I guess. <laughs> well, well, you certainly have, but, but I want to, first of all, disabuse people of the notion that you, you're you just still Magnolias. You know, that, that you haven't done any other things. But why don't we get back to Steel Magnolias and tell people some more of the film work and the film script work that you've done over the years. Oh, oh I, I was going to let you do the... Uh, the oh, 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 okay. My, uh, okay. Um, well, uh, ap- while we were filming uh, Steel Magnolias, I got the idea to do Soap Dish, um, which then starred Sally Field and Kevin Klein and Robert Downey Jr. And, um, and then after that, I, um, I uh, did a film uh, uh, called uh, First Wives Club. Oh, that was which was a pretty big hit, as I recall. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, people seem to really, really enjoy that one. Now, now let me ask before, uh, just before we get on, um, as the writer of these movies, not the director, were you? How much were you able to be on set and hobnob with the stars and also have input, or was it a case where you turned in your version of the script, three other people then worked on it, and you never saw it until you went to the theaters at its premiere? Um, well, uh, it's a little bit of a little bit of all of that. Um, Steel Magnolias. I was very lucky. Well, it was filmed in our in my hometown, and it was filmed in the houses and the churches and the grocery stores where everything happened. And uh, and Ray Stark, the producer, and Herbert Ross, the director, were very interested in the in the reality and the veracity of everything. As it is a totally true story. So um, they were very. They wanted me on the set. I wasn't on the set all the time. I, we were. Uh, we we spent all our time together because it was filmed in uh, Natchitoches, Louisiana, uh, my hometown, where I'm speaking to you uh, from right now. Mm-hmm. And um, it was it was a it was a situation where it wasn't like you're in Los Angeles and everyone finishes the day of shooting and uh, they all go off to Spago or to their homes or families. Uh, there was really no place else to go other than to each other's houses, and we would have. Um, and we'd have potluck suppers, and so it was like one big family for three and a half months here. Um, Soap Dish was a, was a different situation. I uh, came up with that. Uh, I was really busy working on some other things at the time, and so it was shot, and uh, they did a, a wonderful job, and uh, really, I, I wasn't around much there at all. First Wives Club, again, I was working on um, a version 
production of the of, um, the Evening Star, which is uh, I was directing that, which I had also uh, written. It was a sequel for Terms of Endearment. So I was I was making my own film while First Wives Club was being filmed um, across the um, across the continent. So I didn't uh, didn't see much of that filming. Um, I, I'm a little curious how you got to be able to shoot Evening Star. I mean, had you done short films, commercials? Had you had you ever directed anything before then? No, I hadn't, but I uh, I became very, very close friends with uh, Shirley MacLaine during the uh, during the filming of Steel Magnolias, and we had been looking for something to work together and, um, and work together on. And then when when the um, when the, the the novel because Terms of Endearment was a was a novel by Larry McMurtry when he wrote the sequel sequel mm -hmm. to Terms of Endearment, which was called The Evening Star. Uh, which was the continuation of that drama. Um, Shirley, of course, uh, was going to reprise her role as Aurora, and uh, she said, hey, would you like to write it? And I said, well, sure, and I wrote it for her. And then when the studio was looking for directors, uh, they talked to many, many people, and then uh, Shirley stepped up and said, you know what, why don't we, why don't we let uh, Bobby have a you know, have a shot at directing this because he's written it, he understands the material, he understands the world and so that was that was kind of that. I mean I did have to jump through some hoops and prove myself. Um, uh, and um, I did Wow, I mean it just it is pretty amazing. This isn't even like an indie feature. This is a, a major Hollywood film. And she went back for you and you, you did know, direct Jack Nicholson and Juliet Lewis and, <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, it was a, it was a major thing. Now, the, the bad news, of course, is that Evening Star was not particularly well-received. It didn't, didn't do too well, and, and the reviews weren't so great. But, but do you know that when you've wrapped up a film? Do you, ha do you have a sense of whether it will be well-received, badly received? Do you, or do you not really know until all the reviews come out, you know, a week's gone by and the grosses don't go up? Um, you, you really never know. Um, I think that uh, we loved it. We were proud of it. We still are proud of it. Um, all sorts of things come into to play in those situations. I mean, um, it was such an amazingly honored and treasured original film in terms of endearment. I mean, sometimes people just don't want to see a continuation mm. of that. I mean, sometimes that's just the situation. And, uh, and you know, so that... And, um, you don't need and, to and kill a mockingbird people, too. Yeah. They just yeah. don't. Uh, they don't think it should be done or whatever. But it was not. I mean, Larry wrote the book. He continued the story. Sure. Um, so it was just an attempt to continue the the, the story. And and we we loved it. And um, you know, we're proud of it. And and are you still friends with Shirley MacLaine? Oh yeah. Wonderful. For her yesterday. <laughs> I, I interviewed her a couple of well, a couple of months ago now, but but interestingly, um, you know, seems seems like um, seems like a character out of Steel Magnolias, <laughs> definitely. I mean, you know, she was in the film, but you know what I'm saying. I think. Well, she's a, she's a, Shirley's fantastic. She's a character out of this world, not just out of Steel Magnolias. No, she's a, she's she's completely amazing and, and totally totally. One of the most vibrant and talented people I've ever uh, I've ever met. And then you also did um, another film called Laws of Attraction. That was kind of a, a romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. And well, that was a rewrite. Yeah. That had been in process, and uh, producers, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, the producers, um, you know, offered me that the, the chance to rewrite that, and uh, and I did. And I, you know, I love Julianne, love Julianne more, and it was a chance to uh, to work. That's that's the thing that I really get most excited about is the opportunity to write for uh, people that I just, you know, kind of worship and think, uh, you know, because you, you you create a character, you 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 give this incredibly talented um, uh, person and Pierce as well, and give them fun things to do, and then they take that ball and run with it, and, and it's just it's such a joy to be a part of. That's what attracts me more to material than anything, is the chance to, to work with the actor. And, and by the way, when you say Pierce, you're, you're talking about Pierce Brosnan, Pierce in case Brosnan, people yeah, haven't seen, seen the film. Now, and also speaking of very famous actors in or near Robert Harling's work, we do have to get to that whole casting of 
Steel Magnolias, and I, I, everybody who was anybody wanted to be in it, including apparently, I mean, I'm, I'm getting some of my info, I guess, from, from Wikipedia and such, but was, was Liz Taylor interesting at one point? Absolutely, yeah. Did you talk to her? Did you meet her? Did, or was she just sent overtures through her agent? No, um, I, I did meet, I did meet Ms. Taylor. <laughs> um, I had had tea earlier, uh, about a month before she came to see the show in New York uh, with Betty Davis. And Betty Davis had mentioned to uh, Elizabeth Taylor, there was, there was, I wish I could do a better Betty Davis impersonation. <laughs> there's, a, there's a role for you, uh, Elizabeth. And um, so Ms. Taylor came to, came to see the, the, the play, and it was, such a, it was such a sensation when she showed up and word had gotten out that she was coming. They actually, there were so many people there to see her go to the theater, walk into the theater, that they had to shut down the street. So, um, yeah, so she came to see it, and, and you always, uh, this was my, I was very young, very wet behind the ears, and, you know, very, this is my first thing I'd ever written, and I realized she's going to be sitting in the audience when an actress on stage said, when it comes to suffering, she's right up there with Elizabeth Taylor, and I went, <laughs> think about those things. You don't think about those things when you're just writing this little thing and you have no idea if it's even going to be produced. And then I was holding my breath and I was watching her, and um, she uh, she laughed her head off. <laughs> so good, yeah. I mean, yeah. if she hadn't, that would have been a very interesting evening right there. <laughs> well, I mean, come to as I, as as I knew, got to know more about her over throughout the years. I mean, she no one had a. a But how do you, so here's, here's the question, I mean, when you're in that position of, well, I guess you were the casting director or the director of Steel Magnolias, but how do you say no to Elizabeth Taylor when, when she wants to, you know, don't, it's amazing that a star like that doesn't just say, okay, I want to play so-and-so, and the studio says, she's playing so-and-so. Um, oh, gosh, I would, I, I, as the writer, I, I would really at that point never have been in that position. It's not so uh, much that you say no, it's just that it just won't work out, or or she's not available, or we're doing we're going another way. It's it, it's not like oh no, you can't do it. It's it's just more that it, it's more. The, I think it was more of a scheduling situation, and probably a you know something about you know some people. There are actors you could say yes, great, and you're going to go um, film in Louisiana in July, August, and September, and there's scenes that take place in winter, and you're going to have to wear sweaters and overcoats, and they'll go nope, not interested. <laughs> Well, can I ask why, uh, first of all, how did you end up meeting and becoming friends with Betty Davis? And well, I, you know, whether she was interested in a role and did that work out and stuff? Well, the, um, uh, the, I, <laughs> that's <laughs> kind of a long story. I'm glad we have a few minutes. Sure, sure. Um, I, I had just written a play. It had just, it was catching on, you know, um, critics, everything was going, you know, it was just one of those things, you know, it was starting to happen. And um, word had gotten out that there were sixth grade roles for, um, not my, somebody else's words, not mine, sixth grade roles for women. So um, I was sitting in my little apartment in New York and my, um, my uh, phone rings and this voice, once again, I wish I could do a better <laughs> uh, interpretation. This voice is Mr. Harling. This is Betty Davis. And I said, oh, Timmy, stop it. I'm busy because <laughs> I have this friend named Timmy who did a wonderful Right. Well, and then there was dead silence, and the voice said, "Excuse me, this is Betty Davis." And I went, "Oh my God!" To myself, <laughs> Betty Davis. And, uh, I said, "Yes, Miss Davis. This is Robert Harling. How may I help you?" And she said, "I hear you've written a wonderful play. I would like you to come to tea." And I said, oh, "Okay." So the next day, I was scheduled to go to her, go to her suite at her hotel, and um, uh, I had tea with Betty Davis, and I just had. It, it, I, I still to this day, I'm sitting here and like with little goosebumps thinking about it. Um, to be to walk in and to have this woman, she she fixed the tea. Nobody else was around. She just fixed the tea, and she wanted to talk about acting, and she wanted to talk about film, and she wanted to talk about stuff she wanted to do and the role of Weezer. Mm. And uh, to us, 
five minutes went by, yeah. and she was uh, she was talking about everything. She was talking about now Voyager, and she was talking about Baby Jane, and she was talking about. I, I could not believe I was sitting there with one of the great icons of the 20th century, just telling me stuff. And at the end, at the end, she walked me to the elevator, and I remember being standing inside the elevator, and she's outside the elevator, with cigarette in hand. And she said, well, Mr. Harling, someone else might possibly pay Weezer, but if they do, you and they will hear from Betty Davis. <laughs> a bitter closed door closed. Whoa. And someone else did, obviously, in the plane. <laughs> I mean, how could you, again, how, wound up, surely wound up. <laughs> right, but did that put you in a, in a, a position of, like, being real no, 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 like I said, you know, there's so many variables that happen during that situation, and, you know, she, in that kind of situation, and, and she was, it was, it was fairly near the end of her life, so. Well, um, yeah, that's what I was kind of wondering about, yeah, too. And it was, and, and, and once again, once, you know, when agents and managers and, and you, you realize, she had not seen the play at that point. And uh, she came a couple of nights later. Again, incredible sensation. Uh, her showing up at the theater, sure. and uh, and you know, I think once she saw the physical demands of the uh, the role and and um, and all of that, I, you know, it, 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 sometimes things just don't work out, and that that happens all the time. I mean, there are all those famous stories of people who who uh, who originally were supposed to do roles and didn't, and then someone else took the role and then became, you know, hugely. Sure. Absolutely. Now, we are talking, by the way, with Robert Harling, invariably about Steel Magnolias. I mean, he's done all that other stuff. That, that's the one that just keeps cropping up again and again. And it, it cropped up just a couple of weeks ago, again, as a remake on the uh, Lifetime Channel Network. What did you think? I, I did not get to see it, but what did you think of this new version of the material? Um, I was I I, uh, I thought the cast was extraordinary and I thought that the the direction was really really terrific. I think the the adaptation into into well I mean it, it really even it really wasn't even that much of a uh, of an adaptation. It's just it, it really speaks to how the um, it really speaks to how the the the, the work. And the story of my mother and my sister, which it tells tells their story, is just is universal. I've seen um, I, I I saw a rough cut. I actually didn't see it broadcast on the, on the, the screen. Um, the, uh, you know, it's just it's wonderful. It's wonderful actors saying my words. You know, I, who can argue <laughs> anything about that? Um, I, you know, and, and people say, oh, there was so much um, attention and, and, and people asking what I felt about it. And all. I was not, I did not adapt it. I didn't do any of the updating on the script. I didn't, because, you know, if you're going to, the play is like two hours and 20 minutes long. And if you're going to do it on television, it has to be like 142 minutes or something like that. And so they, you know, they had to make all sorts of sure. adjustments and edits. And I didn't want to be, have anything to do with touching my... <laughs> my baby mm. so uh, but I was really thrilled that it was able to be refreshed in this way and um, so, you know you sit there and you watch wait a minute they cut that thing well they had to now let's go back to the to the writing of Steel Magnolias because the, the, the really staggering thing is you weren't a drama student you weren't a, a writing student you, you, didn't, you didn't have ten one acts in your drawers and three failed plays I mean you, you went through a personal experience with your family, and this came out. I mean, I would just love to hear that that whole process, that journey. Um. Well, I it, it was a, the the death of my sister from diabetes. Right. Um, who is the, the character Shelby is based upon her, and the character Melinda is based on um, my mother, and all the other women are, are women that were in my life. Uh, at the time, and I was I was so overwhelmed by the support that this group of women gave each other and their strength. I mean, uh, the the men in the family, we were all basket cases. We couldn't even function, but the women just kept doing it and kept it going and kept everything together, and that made such an impression on me. Um, when uh, I wanted to make something. Uh, 
uh, some sort of trivia. Somehow I, it really bothered me that the child that my sister had and that is portrayed as Jackson in the, in the piece and in the film, he's not in the play, the character's not in the play, but, but in, in, uh, in the film, that uh, he would never know. He would, be, he would grow up completely unaware of how incredibly magnificent and what a wonderful spirit his mother was and, and, and all the, the things that went on to, to, to support them as, as my sister had this kid. And so I, I just was really, really torn up about it. And I have a, a really good friend, Michael Weller, a very, very famous... Uh, oh, playwright, yes. Yeah, a very, very successful playwright. And he and his wife were very good friends of mine. And they kept urging me, uh, his wife especially, Kathy Talbert, uh, kept urging me, write something for him, write something for him. And I thought, I'm not a, you know, I don't know how to write a play or something. They would just write anything. So I sat down uh, thinking I was going to write sort of a, sh a short story which would detail the journey of these women and, and all of this, this experience in my life. And I was missing, in writing the prose, I was missing the fun dialogue and the, and the humor and the, and the strength of, of the language of the area. And so I, I was an actor, so I know what a play looks like. Oh, I, know, I didn't realize you were an actor. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask what it is? Yeah, but when you put the end, or, or you know, curtain, or end of play on the end of that first draft, that first script, how different was it from the production that then went to the WPA and then into you know the, the commercial off Broadway production? I mean, were there a lot of further drafts? Was there a lot of tinkering, or was it like ninety to ninety-five percent exactly the same? Pretty much 
pretty much the same during the remained pretty much the same during the process. But uh, Pamela would uh, would come to me with a stopwatch during rehearsal and said, "Okay, you've allowed a minute and thirty four seconds to wash." Uh, roll and blow out a woman's hair. Let's go back to the drawing board and <laughs> <laughs> figure this out. So it was more um, the, the, the changing of everything was more of, more of a technical uh, staging. See, um, if, you're, if your director had been Robert Wilson, he would have said, you, you'll need three minutes at least to probably <laughs> in slow motion. You know, I want to see suds. Uh, <laughs> so that was, it was more, um, I, I would say it, it the, the, the text was really remained pretty true during the whole process, but moving things around and inventing inventing new uh, new conversations. Uh, so just just to let stage time uh, be uh, <laughs> doable. And, and my question also is after the pretty much immediate success of, of Steel Magnolias, I guess were you then snapped up by Hollywood, which is why you didn't do more theater. Um, well, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of like, like I'm a play road, sort of. I mean, <laughs> I've always wanted to do more theater, but it's, I have all these really great friends who are just so brilliant and so fantastic and just burning with either Tony Kushner and Doug oh, Wright and no, sure. Craig Lucas, and they, they, uh, they all, that is how they, that, that's how they express themselves. I, it, I didn't set out to be a playwright. I didn't set out to be a writer. I set out to do something so this kid would know who his mama was. So it's not like that, that oh, yes, playwriting is, is, is something I must do. That was not, that wasn't in the cards. Um, well, that, you, were, you were in theater on some, or I guess in film and TV, because you dropped law to go into acting. Yeah. So... Yeah. You, you, there was some level of showbiz in you. What, what, what yeah, did you do as an actor? Yeah, well, I, yeah. you know, well, the whole, one of the things I, I, after or during the early, early process of Steel Magnolias was I was thinking, great, now I can write a role for me to act. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh, and basically, the, the things that you've done in movies have been other people's ideas that you've been asked to work on. As yeah, opposed to so coming so up, so oh, here's a movie. Soap Dish was. Um, the, uh, soap Dish came about because uh, I remember I said that we would all get together on while we were filming Steel Magnolias and, and have potluck suppers and stuff. And we would do that every night. And we would play games and charades and all that sort of thing just every, every night. Right. And one night we were doing kind of a question game, and I asked all the actresses, "What is um, what's the what's the one role you've always wanted to play but never got a chance to play?" And um, uh, Shirley said, "Well, I've, I've never played an alcoholic." Well, since then she's done uh, postcards from the edge and other things. <laughs> and Daryl said, "Well, I just only want to do uh, I only want to do really strong women that really make a difference, but I'll never play a prostitute." And of course, she's played several. <laughs> Um, Julia said, hey, I just got here, I'll do anything. Olympia wanted to do uh, Brecht and some Bur anyway, you know, really meaty theater. Uh, Dolly said, well, Medea, of course. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then when we got Sally, Sally said, you know, uh, I always play really, really noble characters that wear, like, jeans and T-shirts or, or really poor people with, you know, that wear kind of raggy you know, places in the heart. In Norma Norma Ray. Ray, sure, yeah. She said, I never get a chance to really look nice. For once, I'd like to play a bitch that wears nice clothes. So I thought, and that stuck with me. And so I started thinking, okay, well, what if someone who's perceived as America's sweetheart, who Sally is, was, um, yeah, yeah. at the time, and uh, what if she is really actually 
a very um, a bitch for people who's ruined the lives of everybody around her like a soap opera star because as an actor I knew something about soap operas because I had been on uh, a couple and my roommate for several years was a soap actor so I've been around that world so they say write what you know and uh, this was the second crack out of the box and and I thought okay the world of soap opera America's sweetheart um, who really has lots of secrets and whose life is even more absurd than the role she plays in the soap opera and that's how soap dish uh, was created so that's yeah that's well, kind of how that happened and you know and to try to get back to the theater because I really would love to um, hmm. turning it into a, a musical yeah I was going to ask about that who's who's the composer lyricist on that uh, George Stiles and Anthony Drew they're uh, two incredibly talented guys they're English they did the new version of Mary Poppins that's playing on Broadway right now um, they've had uh, much uh, much success in England and they've done a wonderful wonderful job of taking and musicalizing this, this crazy world of soap opera for the for the stage, we just did um, we just did a reading of it in uh, you know sort of a workshoppy reading backers audition thing um, in New York uh, last month. Kristen Chenoweth, uh, oh. the Celeste Talbert role, and uh, John Stamos uh, did the Kevin Klein role. Jane Krakowski did the Kathy Moriarty role. Um, so it was quite something. <laughs> it was oh, amazing. Bad. And do you have nibbles? I mean, what's the next step now? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, that was that was the uh, that that was sort of the kickoff. Now the next step is is you know what you do with those things. You, you workshop and and uh, you know you learn from that. You learn from that um, from that audience reaction. And you take that feedback and you work on it. That's that's kind of the way it happens with musicals, as you know. Sure, sure, absolutely. We are, by the way, talking with. Robert Harling, we have just a couple more minutes. Are you still free for a couple of minutes? Oh, gosh, it's going fast. It sure is, but I'm having a marvelous time with the author. By the way, well, I do want to say, yes, he, he wrote the scripts for Soap Dish and the First Wives Club and uh, The Laws of Attraction, but let's also be mindful of not only the 25th anniversary of Steel Magnolias, but that there's going to be a 25th anniversary reading of the play, I should have mentioned this earlier, I apologize for not bringing it up until now, but on December 3rd at the Lucille Lortel Theater off-Broadway, it's a celebrity staged reading of Steel Magnolias, featuring Blythe Danner, Marin Massey, Annie Potts, Margot Martindale, which is really exciting because she was in the original one. She was playing Truby back then, now she's going to be playing the mother, Malin. Uh, Celia Keenan-Bolger is in it, she's a big rising star. In, um, in Broadway and off-Broadway theaters. I think she's still in Peter and the Starcatcher, right. as we speak. And Judith Ivey is directing, and all the proceeds are going to benefit juvenile diabetes, of course. So, um, kind of kind of way, way cool. And, and the people, by the way, who are on the board of this reading are all the folks from the movie of Steel Magnolias. Am I right about that? That's right. Julia, Sally, Olympia, Shirley, Holly. Were, were any of them approached about doing the reading, or, or, or you didn't have any ideas about that? Well, one of the one of the um, I don't think they would have I don't think they would have wanted to. They've already sort of done it. You know mm. what I mean? They were, they, they they kind of they put their stamp on the role, and uh, they were all they've been so uh, fabulous and supportive and, and generous with their um, with their. Um, uh, with her, you know, with yeah. their with their acknowledgement of, of it. I mean, that we were we were thrilled and very honored and humbled that they would want to be on the honorary committee. But um, it's uh, it's incredibly exciting, um, and like you say, to uh, for me, as, as as 25 years have gone by, I, I get this constant. Uh, you know, the play's been done everywhere. I mean, Japan. I mean, it's you know dozens of languages and all of that and what what seems to be happening now is some of some of the actresses who played the younger generations of uh, of uh, Anel or Shelby are now in productions where they're playing Malin and Truby and some of the Malins and Trubies have uh, written me and said now I'm playing Cle uh, Weezer and Clary it's just it life goes on it's just it's just a very very exciting thing for someone for someone who's written written uh, written roles for women that to see they keep giving back to the women that's just that's just very very humbling. 
Um, and um, Margot, I just I'm so excited about Margot. I wrote the uh, the rule of, the role of Trinity for her originally, and now um, and now she's coming back and playing Weezer, which is she, she boy she'll just she'll. Wait, is she she's playing Weezer or or Malin? Sorry. I'm sorry. What? Is she she's playing Weezer or Malin? Uh, Margot Martindale. Yeah. Oh, she's just no, she's playing uh, Weezer. Oh, I'm sorry, I had that wrong. But no, she's playing Weezer. Great, mm -hmm. even better. So so cool. So quite a cast, by the way, being assembled for December third at the Lucia Lortel Theater. Let me let me just also give the um, the email uh, the website for that is Steel Magnolias Dash. Uh, I can't tell if that's a dash or an underscore, but I believe it's a dash. Twenty five years dot org. Steel Magnolias dash twenty five years dot org. If that's not a dash, it's an underscore. It's pretty, pretty easy to find either way. But do, folks, check that out. And also, uh, creator and producer on, on this is um, Kristen Chenoweth. Is, uh, her name is attached to this. And I wanted to ask about GCB, mm. which is the, the TV show you were involved with for the past couple of years that starred Kristen Chenoweth. And wondering how that came about, et cetera, and so forth. Well, it was, um, there was a book again, uh, written by Kim Gatlin, who is, a, who is um, uh, this great, uh, fabulous, larger-than-life uh, Dallas, uh, Dallas socialite who um, chronicled um, some, some stories that she, that she had experienced and friends had experienced about uh, a woman who comes back and has to deal with the um, hypocrisy and, and some of the and some of the less uh, Christian side of religion sometimes uh, okay. when people are not uh, not as giving and as kind as they should be. And so she wrote this book and um, uh, ABC uh, ABC thought it would make a, um, a terrific terrific series. And so we, uh, they uh, and it was it was uh, purchased well, I guess the rights were gotten by the the uh, very, very uh, prolific and, and very celebrated uh, Darren Starr, who created Sex in the City. And uh, he, and he we, we decided to create this TV series, and we did, and it lasted a year, and we loved, once again, we loved it, we were very proud of it, it was very, very controversial, which is... Um, well, that, that, I wanted to ask you about that, you know, because before you could even get the show off the ground or on the air... You know, the, the right-wing groups and the Christian groups heard about the title. GCB stood for, was it Good Christian Bitches? Something like that is... That was the, that was the, that the title of the book. Yeah. Right, Good Christian... So, I mean, was there ever a thought to say, you know what, let's just get this thing on the... We'll change the title, and we won't have nearly the problems that they're giving us just to even get this on the air and get past controversy over three words. Or, you know, because I know Chenoweth stood firm and said, no, that's the time, you know, I'm, I'm standing by it, why don't you? But w what was the whole thing about that? Well, again, a lot of those things take place, especially in television, take place in rooms far away from where, from mine. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm busy writing, um, uh, busy writing and shooting. So, uh, you know, I, I initially, uh, I thought... Uh, there were many things that it could have been called, I think, but um, but they decided to they decided to stick with well, I, actually they didn't stick with the title. They couldn't have possibly have stuck with the title um, because even now today there's a show on called Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23, but on the same network because there's just in this country there's just too much there's just too much resistance to that. Um, even though, even though William Shatner had no problem being in a, in a TV show called "Shit My Father Says," <laughs> honest to gosh, that, that was the time they, they, uh, they bleeped it out or whatever they did. But nobody, had, nobody had a problem. Maybe because it's Shatner. But I'm sorry, continue. Well, no, but it, it, it was funny because we would have these international uh, meetings, and Australia came. They were thrilled about it. They absolutely loved the show. They'd seen the pilot. They bought it, and and they were. They called it Good Christian Bitches, and, and, the, and, and, and I said, really, you're going to call it that? And they said, what else would you call it? <laughs> and, uh, because it's just, it, it, it was, um, it, I, I think it was a real shame because nothing about the TV show, um, nothing about the TV show whatsoever uh, indicted Christianity, made fun of it, or anything like that. It made fun of people who are hypocritical. That's what it made fun of. And 
um, and not, didn't even make fun of it. I mean, those char the characters, I believe, were all very human and very uh, and very understandable, and of course had flaws, which makes it makes people interesting. I don't. I think the flaws are what make people interesting. If everybody was perfect, they wouldn't be interesting. Um, so uh, I think that it was. Uh, it just didn't. It didn't really get a chance because it was attacked uh, too. It was attacked too soon before it had had a chance to sort of. People had a chance to find it and understand it. But once again, you do these things. You're proud of them. You love them. You're glad you did them. And the relationships that grow out of it. I mean, Kristen's one of my dearest friends now. I mean, and, and all the other cast and and crew. It was a, it was a wonderful experience. I just wish it had had more of a chance to to be found. Now it's been a wonderful experience chatting with Robert Harling. I want to ask, uh, besides Soap Dish the musical, what are you working on currently that you can talk about? Hmm, that I can talk about. Well, well, you know, some writers are like, uh, yeah, they're in the middle of something. They, it jinxes it. I'm like that. I don't want to talk I about am, anything until I have the like end. That. I'm definitely like that. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I am doing there was a, there was a really fabulous small independent film. Uh, released by Focus Features called Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day. And uh, I became obsessed with, so I was the first, uh, I was the first person at the first showing on the Friday when it opened in Los Angeles about five years ago. And I said, this is a musical, a stage musical for Broadway. And I said, I'm going to make this, uh, I want to do this. So it's taken like five years to put the team together and get the rights and all of that. And, um, and so it's, it was a it was a wonderful film. Uh, had Francis McDormand, Lee Pace, um, Mark Strong, Amy Adams, um, and I, I just I fell in love with it. And so we put a team together. Uh, we have uh, Lisa Lambert and Greg Morrison doing music and lyrics. They won a Tony for a Drowsy Chaperone. Oh wow, cool, yeah. Oh, so I'm just it's just a thrill to be able to work with uh, with people like that. And we're in the that's actually. Um, one of my main things right now, and I have to go back to New York tomorrow to have a very long, involved work session on it. So that's kind of that's the first thing. Um, that's the first thing uh, that's up next. I mean, there's you know there's a there's a book on options and you know all that stuff that uh, I'm thinking of uh, pursuing after that. But that's kind of that. Well, that's that's pretty darn good. And can I ask, um, what's what's your personal life at this point? Do you have a partner, a person, pets, what you got? Yeah, I, I, have, uh, I have two dogs named Jet and Titan. Jet so, and Titan, okay. Jet the, and Titan. They're German Shepherds and they're staring at me right now. I think they're hungry. Well, you know, the, the Titans did become the New York Jets, so there is a connection there. <laughs> but, I didn't think of that. But what about, as far as, I, I know it's none of my business, but we always make these things our business. Um, dating, humans, anything like that? Any romance in there somewhere? Surprisingly under, I've never heard that phrase before. <laughs> well, were you in a long-term relationship for a while, you know, a while ago, something like that? No, not, well, ish, that's not, I, that's, I don't, I don't find it that interesting, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, but, but you do have your dogs, so, so that's the most important thing is that you've got your dogs, and even more important is that you've been on this show and such a delight to talk to. And most important of all, December 3rd at the Lucille Lortel Theater, they're doing a reading of the 25-year-old Steel Magnolias with people like Blythe Danner and Mary Massey, Margot Martindale, who was in the original Off-Broadway production, Celia Keenan-Bolger, and more. Do check that out at steelmagnolias-25 years. Dot org for more information about that. And remember, all the proceeds do go to uh, the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. Anyway, Robert Harling, it has been, as I said, really a pleasure to talk to you about all the stuff you've done and are doing, and I certainly wish you great luck on Soap Dish and on all, all the other stuff, all the, the musicals that are, are coming in your life and the novel you've optioned, whatever it is, I wish you great success with it. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great time.